morning and welcome to Friday Live here on Nebraska Public Media. Much of today's show is pre-recorded. I'm Genevieve Randall. We'll have guests in the studio this morning from Yorkshire Playhouse and from the Dream Switch event in Deschler. We'll learn about a music event on a riverside and we'll meet the host of a show that debuts here in Nebraska Public here on Nebraska Public Media tomorrow. Plus there's poetry this week from Tracy Schott. First, bird note. You're listening to Friday Live on Nebraska Public Media. Support for programming comes from Max Creek Winery, celebrating over 20 years of winemaking in Lexington with a commitment to sustainability. Max Creek offers wines, hard cider, craft beer on tap, and patio seating overlooking the vineyards. Open year-round, seven days a week with curbside delivery. MaxCreek.com. We'll start the show with a musician from a Nebraska-based band called Timberline. They opened up a tour of several communities last night with a show in McCook, and they continue tonight with a show at the Merriman in Kearney, and after that, they play Central City, Wood River, and Lincoln. And it's all in celebration of their 50th anniversary. Jim Salestrom joins me this morning, originally from Nebraska. I think Kearney, is that right, Jim? Yeah, that's right. Hi, Genevieve. It's really Hi. great to be on your show. And thank you to uh, all of your listeners out there for uh, being so great to us. Uh, it is wonderful to be from Nebraska. There is no place like Nebraska. And uh, <laughs> we played last night for a very large number of people that came out to raise money for Tor Olson's family. Tor Olson was a beloved member of the community. I have been a professional musician all my life. Started with my older brother in Kearney uh, in 1971, and we're celebrating our 50th year. And three of us are the original members. Uh, We've lost a couple along the way. Uh, Sadly, uh, two of our members passed, Bill Howland and Doug Duggan. We've got a really good band. We've replaced those two guys, our our beloved brothers, with uh, Ken Miller from Colorado Springs and then my son, Chuck's nephew, James Salstrom, who's come in from Nashville. We are so excited to play Carney tonight. Uh, we're sold out at the Merriman Theater. 725 people, we've sold that out. We're going to be at Wood River at their Performing Arts Center on Sunday at 2.30 in the afternoon. And there still are tickets for that one. And we're going to be at the Central City Performing Arts Center on Monday night. And there's still our tickets for that. And then at the Playmore Ballroom, the famous Bobby Lane, you know, the (laughs) most famous place in Lincoln to play, the Playmore Ballroom on Tuesday night. And we're doing these shows all kind of like back to back because everybody's kind of scattered around the world. I have a home in Montana and a home in Colorado and Chuck's in Jacksonville, Florida. We're bringing everybody together. We'd like to invite everybody to come back and experience the joy of what Timberline was and what Timberline still is. We're just so grateful to get such a great turnout. It'll be great to see old friends. And if you've never seen the band Timberline or don't know what it's about, (laughs) bring your party shoes. There might be some dancing. There might be some beer. You never know. It's just great to put the band back together and to get to come back to Nebraska. How did the whole idea of Timberline start to begin with? We didn't want to play proms and frat parties We wanted to play Holiday Inns. That was our big goal because Holiday Inns were a big thing. They had the velvet rope, you know, with the guy at the door with the bow tie that sat you at your table. And when gas was cheap, people used to drive an extra hour or so back to Kearney and Grand Island and North Platte to see entertainment. And the Holiday Inn in Kearney was a big deal. They had the best entertainment between Chicago and, uh, and Denver, I mean, and, and Nashville. They brought in the best groups that you could possibly hear. We just got our fingers and our toes wet 
from that. Nebraska has always been a great place for entertainment. Stanel Sound was out of Kearney. They were the third largest sound company in the country. Because of their association with Kearney State College, I got to see the Fifth Dimension, Johnny Cash, Lily Tomlin, Rich Little, Dr. Hook and the Medicine Show, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, and Timberline got to open for a lot of those groups. We got tied up with a really big agency out of Minneapolis that used to book John Denver. Oh, I got to meet my hero, John Denver, there too. I ended up being friends with him for 25 years. So we did a lot of dirt band music and a lot of John Denver music. We traveled for eight years around the country. We got a national recording contract on CBS Records, Epic, and we sold 50,000 copies. And I'm sorry to be so windy, but I've got to tell you one more thing. I get to play for 700 children this afternoon at the, at the Merriman Theater in Kearney. <laughs> Don't tell anybody, but the last two songs, the curtains are going to roll back, and Timberline is going to back me up on the zoo song, and Mayor Take Me Home, and we should have those kids bouncing off the walls by the time they have to go home tonight. I noticed that in addition to all the shows you're playing, Timberline's also going to be inducted into the Nebraska Performing Arts Hall of Fame. Wow, yeah, I forgot about <laughs> that. They're going to induct us into uh, the Nebraska Performing Arts Hall of Fame tonight in Kearney, and then we're going to give the plaques back, and they're going to give them back to us again in Lincoln. We had such large followings in both those places. It's a real honor. Uh, Mike Semrad who was, you know, and Little Joe and the Ramrods and Smoke Ring, all these really famous groups in Kearney have been inducted. And he keeps the spirit of all the bands that were very popular and keeps the spirit of music alive in Nebraska. And so that's a real honor. We're really excited about that. Did I see a picture of you with Dolly Parton on your website? Yes, you did. What's the story on that? Well, I've been in her band off and on, uh, since 1979, I was recently on a TV show with her in December. I was one of the angels in the background singing on a Christmas special she had on CBS called A Holly Dolly Christmas. And that all came about because of Stanel Sound, Stan Miller, and Timberline. We got to open for Dolly Parton for about seven months, and she really liked our band a lot. And when Timberline decided that they just couldn't couldn't do it anymore, I got a phone call from her people and I auditioned for her band. And I've been singing with her and playing guitar and banjo with her all over the world since 1979. She is the nicest person you could ever possibly meet. And uh, <laughs> I am so grateful that I've, I've been able to uh, learn so much from one of the greatest storytellers and one of the prettiest ladies and one of the most beautiful people anyone could ever hope to meet. Well, Jim Salstrom is a musician originally from Kearney, Nebraska, who knew he wanted to be a musician when he was a toddler, according to his website. He and his band Timberline are on a reunion tour with shows tonight in Kearney, continuing through Wood River, Central City, and Lincoln. And we will have a link to more on the Nebraska Public Media website right there on the Friday Live page. Jim, great to talk with you. Thank you so much. Genevieve, thank you so much, and uh, thanks for all you bring to Nebraska with your beautiful show. I'm going to be on a PBS show out of Montana called 11th and Grant with Eric Funk, and it's a really cool show. It's coming out in November. Genevieve, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome, Jim. And this is Friday Live on Nebraska Public Media online at nebraskapublicmedia.org. Thanks for joining us this morning. Next, here on Friday Live, the Yorkshire Playhouse is inviting you to an intense and beautiful show. The title is Rabbit Hall and Mitchell Rouse or Roos. Roush. Roush. Every time. It's Every all right. time, Mitch. Every time. It keeps our visits interesting, though. <laughs> <laughs> There's more than that that's interesting about our visits, I'm, I, I guarantee. But so, <laughs> Mitchell Rausch. Yes. 
and Danielle Deal are both here with Yorkshire to talk about it. It is great to see you both. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. It's always a party when we come here. It is. I love it. I love talking with you York folks. <laughs> <laughs> so this, we're laughing now, but this is actually a, a very serious show. I was kind of moved, actually, mm. by a question in the description that said, can anyone really be prepared for their world to come crashing down? And I thought... Wow. Well, many of us have experienced that since March of, of 2020. Just a little bit of collective trauma. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, so, Mitch, you're directing this. You want to tell us just a little overview of what makes this a story about trauma? Absolutely, Genevieve. Again, thanks for having us on. Um, it, it, Rabbit Hole is written by David Lindsay Abair, won the Pulitzer Prize in 2007. That's kind of the stats. And it's it's rare that you get a chance to do a show like that, let alone in a rural community. So we're excited to bring it here. But yeah, to, to answer your question more directly, um, this show is about, without giving too much away, it's about a married couple and their family as they grapple with a great loss. But it takes place Afterward, It's mm-hmm. all about afterward. You don't see the horrible incident. You don't mm-hmm. get into the middle of what you would think to be the climactic thing because what happens with grief is grief is, well, one, grief isn't linear, but grief, as we've talked about for this show, is it's that both welcome and unwelcome visitor that shows up unannounced and sits in a chair next to you and doesn't tell you when it's going to leave. And it does that in and out. And so um, Rabbit Hole is about a married couple that is trying to, hold on to each other in the wake of losing their child. Mm. Um, and, and it follows their progression through the first year, essentially, of, of experiencing that loss. Mitch, what's the difference for you in directing a, a very emotional drama like this as opposed to some other genre? Yeah, so um, it's a small cast, five people, which is great. I, I enjoy the small, intimate ones. And of course, the script is fantastic, right? Like, we, we've been given an incredible gift here. But in terms of directing, um, w- with this one, you experience so many different emotions and grief is such a universal concept, but it's also incredibly nuanced. So we've talked an awful lot about um, less is more and how can we make this feel as real and authentic as possible and not quite so much theater. (laughs) It's more kind of like theater. Hmm. Right. And, and, and then, of course, you know, the greatest hits that we talk about all the time, which is match energy with people you have on stage, make your choices, hit pace, and you'll create a unique experience for the audience. But in terms of directing the show, it's just been about, OK, here's here are the key points we're leading up to. And here's what the story is really about. Now, let's strip this back and say, can we do this as authentically as possible? And Danielle, you have quite an important role in this, I think, is your part of the parent group here. You're the mother in this play. She's the lead. She carries the show. (laughs) What's she like? Um, She's very real, and I think that's uh, one of the great parts of this script and this performance is, I think, it's the realism of it. um, That when you see these characters, you'll see people you actually know, and you'll see yourself Mm. in them and all of those things. And yeah, she's very real and uh, very broken at this part of her life. Yeah, so playing Becca as she's dealing with the loss of a child, do you yourself find yourself feeling uh, emotional? Does it take you a spell after a scene to get, or even the full show, to get out of that mindset? Absolutely, yeah. How do you do it? Um, I think you have to have kind of your own techniques for kind of shaking it off at the end of it because you do really get into the motions. And most of us have experienced grief in our life. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's not a unique thing in the world. Yeah. <laughs> to, yeah. Um, so I think you do tap into that in your own um, emotion on that for sure. So, you know at intermission and after the show and all those kind of things, you have to find a way to let that, let that go. So I think the silver lining here, which is something we've been hearing throughout this last year, right? That there are some silver linings to these things. Mm -hmm. There is healing. There is hope. Mm -hmm. Where, where do we find that in this show? Uh, that's a good question. Um, Definitely just as nuanced as the grief, I would say, in this particular installment. But the interesting thing is, um, I think what I appreciate the most about this script is that there's a lot of subtext and it's and it's not spoon fed. And so there are moments when I think the audience definitely wonders if the marriage is going to make it, but they never say the words, you know, we're not going to make it or we should get a divorce. Like it doesn't go heavy handed. It's much more nuanced. And the same goes with the hope there. 
There are genuine moments of humor in this show, as is, as is with any good drama, I think. And then there are also some genu- genuine moments of tenderness and empathy, mm-hmm. and, 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 and they're unlocked in these subtle moments of connection, in moments of quiet, in um, sharing a baked good with somebody. And... I think that's part of what makes this show resonate is, and kind of me back to the authenticity piece, is because it's not, we're not doing the theatrical or Hollywoodized version of grief and resolution. We're, we're doing the, the type of experience and hopeful um, nods in the sense of like, this is what it's like to carry this in your home. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's, there's some hopeful moments there, mm-hmm. but you got to kind of look for them, but it's the same way with the grief too. The grief is overt, but it's not going to hit you over the head either. Well, and there are still shows tonight, tomorrow, and Sunday. And I see that masks are required indoors there at Yorkshire Playhouse. Um, What's in the plans after you close Rabbit Hole? Um, After Rabbit Hole, then we'll have our Christmas show coming up. And we'll be announcing our new season in November. So we've got a lot of things coming up there. So, yeah, but a Christmas show will be a comedy again. So that'll be good. Like said, <laughs> Take through the full range of, of emotions, right? <laughs> Holds the one for us. Then we'll go back and do a comedy for the masses again. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Well, Mitchell Rausch is directing the show Rabbit Hole. And Danielle Deal plays Becca, the mom in that show. That's on stage in York at the Yorkshire Playhouse this weekend. And we will have a to more information on the Friday Live page at nebraskapublicmedia.org. Mitchell and Danielle, thank you. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having us. It was a blast. Thank you. And you are listening to Friday Live, Our State, Your Stories. This is Nebraska Public Media. is coming to the airwaves here in Nebraska this weekend called Livewire. Now, you've heard the host before, perhaps on CBS Sunday Morning, This American Life, or on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Livewire's mission, by the way, is to bring riveting, underrepresented voices to their stage for hilarious, heartbreaking, unexpected, and honest conversations that leave their listeners forever changed. Who is this host? Well, the show is taped before a live audience in Portland, Oregon, and I think there will definitely be some affinity between Friday Live fans and Livewire fans, as they do feature folks who make art with music, words, and much more. Nebraska is ready, but is host Luke Burbank ready for Nebraska? Luke Burbank, welcome to Friday Live. Hi there, Genevieve. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Luke, I do want to make sure you're ready here for Nebraska. Okay. But let's talk about Livewire a little bit first. Um, so it taped before a live audience, but right now, sometimes, right? We haven't had a live audience since the pandemic started as far as uh, recording new programs. Uh, luckily, we've been doing this for years and years. So we have a pretty deep archive of interviews that we've done. So what we've done during the pandemic is kind of intersperse interviews that we had already recorded in front of a crowd. And then things that were recorded, you know, from our homes, basically, like for a while, we were calling it the Livewire house party because we were all, you know, trapped in our houses, me and the co-host Elena Passarello and the guests. Most of the guests uh, would be hiding in a bathroom in their house if they had children, just hiding from their family so they could do the interviews with us. Um, So it was a weird time during the pandemic to do our kind of show. But it's actually very exciting because we are going to uh, have our first live show with a live audience here in Portland, actually on October 14th. And we're going to be uh, continuing with that as long as it's safe and advisable. So we are getting back to some sense of normalcy, which I'm excited about because I'm one of seven children and have a desperate need for approval and attention and not having the live crowd there giving me feedback as to if my joke was funny or not. It's been tough. This has been solitary confinement for you, Luke. It has. I don't like being alone with my thoughts, and it's been a lot of that during the <laughs> pandemic. So I'm, I'm excited that we're getting back to the live aspect of Live Wire. You mentioned your co-host, Elena Passarello. She's listed on staff as announcer while you are listed as host. What is the difference between your jobs, or are you just really both co-hosts? 
The difference in our jobs is that Elena is the first voice that you hear on the show, so she announces things, and uh, but she's also effectively the co-host of the show. We do a lot of things that are interactive with the listeners. We have a question each week that we put out on social media, and people send in their responses, and Elena is the one who collects up those responses and kind of picks the best ones. And so, yeah, it's a much more of a host-co-host relationship, but maybe just to... Uh, kind of be a throwback to the like the days of the Tonight Show and like Johnny Carson and Ed McMahon. We just thought announcer seemed like kind of a cool job title. You do have a very active social media. Yes, we do. Well, you know, it's 2021. Got to try to stay relevant. I keep pressuring our social media folks to start a TikTok page, but they don't trust me with having access to a show TikTok. So I guess that's still on hold. But we do have everything else, you know, um, obviously Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and things like that. But you kind of have to uh, in this day and age. I mean, you are Nebraska public media, right? It's like we're all creating a lot of media all the time and trying to tell folks about it. And it turns out social media is one of those ways. So we're out there. Okay, so we're going to try something a little different here, Luke, to make sure that you're prepared for Nebraska. Okay. So let's start with with foods. I want to know if you've ever seen or had any of these foods, Luke. It's a a sandwich that is called either a Runza or a Beer Rock. What? Yes. Uh, no, I've I've I I've not had a Runza or a Beer Rock. What uh what's that sandwich look like? Well, some people like to compare them to hot pockets, but don't do that cuz that's just offensive. Like it's this it's way okay. better. It's it's a bun that's stuffed okay. with cabbage and beef and onions and Yum. cooked to perfection. It is delicious. Sometimes you can put okay. cheese on them. Sometimes you don't. Okay. Kool-Aid okay. or Dorothy Lynch dressing? <laughs> I mean, I, I know about Kool-Aid, but Dorothy Lynch dressing is a, uh, that's news to me. What is going on with that? Is that what you chase a, uh, a runza with? Like a runza and a Dorothy Lynch? You could dip your runza in Dorothy Lynch, and that would be one of the most Nebraskan things <laughs> that you had ever seen. What's so great about Dorothy Lynch dressing? It's kind of like French dressing in a way. Mm. It's got kind of a sweet tanginess to it. It is a brilliant orange color. Okay. And it's made here in Nebraska. Dorothy Lynch. Yeah, Dorothy Lynch. Okay. Have you had cinnamon rolls with chili? At the same time? Yeah. No, I have not. Uh, this is also a Nebraska thing. You, would you do you put the chili on the cinnamon roll? Some people do dip it in the in the chili, and other people just have them together. It's complementary taste. You get your kind of savory, spicy chili, and then you get your sweet cinnamon roll. Wow, I will give that a try. That actually doesn't sound terrible. Highly recommend. Okay, so these are activities that I want to know if you have either seen or participated in: tanking or tubing. <laughs> um. Well, I used to be a stand-up comic, and I would tank often, which is to say the audience was unimpressed. Uh, tubing, is that is that like tubing down a river? Yes, yes. Oh, my gosh, you get points. Okay. I finally got one. Look, I, I feel like we should play a little, no, like, do 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 No, I brought my own bell. Oh, good. <laughs> Yay. I just gave myself, like, six <laughs> points when really I'm only deserving of one because uh, I have tubed tubing see that's interesting i guess i i i, I don't know the river uh, the river systems in nebraska but it sounds like you have some good places to do that we have the most miles of river in the country wow also i i understand that um uh, arbor day was started in nebraska right you are correct, yes. With the planting of one million trees, Arbor Day was started in Nebraska, and the Arbor Day Foundation is in Nebraska City. I'm giving myself a point for knowing that, too. You get a point for that, for sure. So tanking is about the same as tubing, Luke, okay. except that you're in a horse tank, what? like the tank they would use to water. Yeah. Some of them are out now made of plastic. It kind of looks like a baby pool, but stronger. And you get in that, and you float down the river. It's so relaxing, and it's great. The other activities I have for you to, to comment on are crane watching, Sand Hills Cranes. Okay, I've been through the Sand Hills. That's a beautiful part of the country. I did not watch any cranes while I was there, so I guess I wasn't doing it right. It's a specific time of year, and you have to be along the Platte River. Mm. Oddly, you don't want to be in the Sand Hills necessarily, although you can see them in the Sand Hills, but along a very specific corridor of the Platte River, like in March is a good time. April sometimes. Sometimes they come in early in February and you can see thousands of cranes and they're just amazing. They have like a six foot wingspan. Wow. Okay. I'll put that on the list. I'm preparing you for this Nebraska business here. 
our plan is when it's safe and advisable to uh, have a, a live edition of LiveWire in Nebraska. You heard it here. To, to celebrate being on Nebraska public media. And I feel like I'm going to hit the ground running. I'm going to have my uh, Dorothy's dressing. I'm going to be putting it on my on my beer rock sandwich as I as I uh, tank down the Platte River. I mean, I just have it all figured out. This sounds like the most Nebraskan vacation that you could <laughs> ever take, Luke. Yeah, I'm ready. So who's on the show this week? Uh, this is very exciting. We have uh, Oscar winning actor Marley Matlin, who's also a, a deaf activist. Uh, she's got this really great movie out called Coda that uh, won the Sundance Grand Jury Prize. Uh, so that's going to be fun. Also, Melissa Phoebos, who's a writer. She's written a really amazing book of essays called Girlhood about uh, sort of how our society treats uh, young women and how that affects their lives. And then we have music from a British blues duo called Ida May. And they, uh, they have this really amazing new album out, which they wrote while road tripping around the U.S. riding in the back of a Kia. Um, but it, you wouldn't know that from the music. It's very soulful and bluesy and cool. So, yeah, that's, that's the plan for our debut show on Nebraska Public Media. Well, Luke Burbank, he's a comic and host of the radio show Livewire, which does debut tomorrow. That's at 11 a.m. Central Time. Luke, thanks so much. Thank you, Genevieve. You are listening to Friday Live here on Nebraska Public Media with conversations that connect Nebraskans online at nebraskapublicmedia.org. Next here on Friday Live, Blixt Locally Grown brings back the Dream Switch, a unique, interactive, locally grown musical performance that utilizes the arts as a catalyst for welcoming and belonging. Becky Bozen is a co-founder along with Peter Walquist of Blixt, and they both join me to tell us more. Welcome back to an in-person interview here on Friday Live, Hooray! you two. Good morning. <laughs> We're so excited. Although, can we say that you've got a- another job coming? We sure can. Be- Karen and I have, I've started, so <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I just started in August as the executive director of Nebraskans for the Arts, so. Congratulations. You know. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, so the Dream Switch takes place this Sunday, October 3rd in Deschler, Nebraska at the Thayer County Activity Center. This isn't the first run for the Dream Switch. Can you share a little bit about um, where you've been with it and what prompted the comeback? The Dream Switch is like the Energizer Bunny of arts projects. <laughs> <laughs> it has survived the pandemic and is banging its drum forward. <laughs> uh, we started We started in collaboration with our partners at Nebraska Community Foundation, actually planning in late 2018, early 2019. And that summer, we hosted our first Dream Switch experience in Auburn and then later in Valley County. And then the pandemic hit, and we were getting ready to partner with the awesome people in Nebraska City and in um, Thayer County. And so we actually, it was interesting how it transformed the project because we started to go much deeper in our pre-planning in the postponement phase because Mm. the dream switch is all about co-creativity. So the song cycle exists that tells the story of a Nebraska returner, a young person, sort of a millennial trying to figure out, do I want to live here or not? But the education and engagement and the conversation that follows is all co-created between us, Nebraska Community Foundation, and most importantly, the local people who know what's important to talk about in their place. Mm -hmm. So take us to where you were when you first started this and first started writing. So um, I wrote this with David Von Campen. This is one of our collaborations. And I had actually written a song about the Kansas fires annually because my youngest son, Quinn, is a terrible asthmatic. And I had written a song called But for Kansas. Um, The chorus went, but for Kansas, darling, you might be all right, if not for this. And then we, I'm going to (laughs) cry. A very emotional morning. (laughs) But um, as, as we started to think about possibilities and some of the work we were all doing, it was like, gosh, this is a distinctly Nebraska sound and Nebraska story. And um, started focusing a lot on the idea of what it means 
to feel at home and to belong. And, you know, I'm a Nebraskan who's left twice, not once, but yeah. twice. Yeah. And this is where I choose to, lo- to live and be creative. But there were a couple times I felt a little disgruntled. So as a lyricist, I started telling that story instead. But for Kansas became but for Shadron. And it's the opening number of the Dream Switch. And in it, our, our young lady has just quit college and is heading for the mountains because she thinks she'll be better off there. And she uh-huh. won't be. But <laughs> did I blow the surprise? <laughs> Spoiler. Yeah. Alert, folks. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Well, and you mentioned David Von Kampen as as well as Natalie McClure helped you bring this together. Um, but then you were behind the lyrics here, Becky. How will this be performed then? You've shared a little bit about the process of creation. What about it's performance? It's different in every community because it is so collaborative. So this weekend in Thayer County, it's going to be very interesting. I provide a little bit of narration, and we have a beautiful band, two cellos, two violins, a guitar. We've got everything. But interspersed with the narration and the music is actually live audio that Tony Hillhouse is doing for us that is um, testimony from people who live in Thayer County that help build upon the arc of the story. So we always take a local component and build it into the dream switch. In Nebraska City, we had a Spanish, a person speaking Spanish and translating live. So it just depends on the community dreams and priorities and that's what we integrate in. Yeah, I was going to say reading about this, um, there are so many demands on folks that maybe some folks who aren't living rurally don't think about. You've got your farm perhaps you're trying to manage. Maybe you've relocated and, like you said, Spanish speaking, trying to get involved in the community and it can be kind of challenging. So um, tell us about that engagement with folks. How do you source these folks? How do you get them to talk honestly about those kinds of issues? Well, I think what's so nice is the Nebraska Community Foundation has done a wonderful job working with local affiliated funds to already help foster a spirit of welcoming and belonging, and that is on the minds of so many of our rural communities. You don't hear that story in the news. You hear about brain drain and, and the bad news, but there's a lot of good news too. And so we have a we have a captive audience with likewise values that's already um, working hard to welcome people. And this just provides an opportunity that's more visceral than, you know, a newsletter yeah. or being able to have the shared experience of music as a conduit is something that people who are interested in research and development in rural places and taking risks and trying new things get on board with and actually help improve upon. So, um, you know, the process, the planning process is lengthy, but it's generative and iterative iterative, excuse me. And, um, you know, we just love to see this thing grow and it grows in ways that it couldn't if it was just in our hands. So help me visualize a little bit after the show, how do people take action? How would you like to see communities like Nebraska City or Deschler or others in Thayer County come together after the performance? So that's really completely in their hands because, of course, they are the experts on their community. In Nebraska City, they already had the second conversation planned. So uh, when we finished the beautiful and, and wonderful conversation there, they knew that in a month they were gathering at the library and they would continue. And, of course, um, the coordinator from NCF is, you know, always working with the community so they have that that's built in from the beginning that it's not we always say that the dream smith is not the end it's the beginning Uh, and in thayer county they've actually uh, come together as a county to do a youth survey with ncf so we will be talking about some of those results that are thayer county specific what their youth had to say they had a really really robust participation so um, again they've been having these conversations leading up to the dream switch and will continue that way beyond um the the concert event itself on sunday and that's really what we love is that we can be part of bringing people together and be a catalyst for these super important and awesome conversations. And it's all brought about because the people of the communities want to welcome, want to, for everyone to belong. Yeah. So it's, it's a joy for us. 
And after the dream switch, it looks like you'll be taking a bit of a dark and spooky turn <laughs> with your event ghouls night out. And you got excited there because I know you want to talk about it. I'm so glad there's not a camera on me right now. Thank you, Jen, for mentioning ghouls night out. It's so cool. It's happening October 30th at the Mill Bistro on Innovation Campus. We have a Blixed Playwriting Fellowship Program. So we are championing four new voices in our community that show great promise as playwrights and those fellows and friends including me will be premiering spooky new work that is in response to the theme of fear for act one act two we hand it over to the audience for ghost stories what stories do you want to share and that kind of parlays (laughs) into a conversation about fear the role it plays in our community, and how we tackle that with the arts and connection. So we're very excited about that. Seats are really limited because we're trying to keep people safe like everybody else. I got you. So please hop on Blix.space if you're interested in tickets because we only have so many seats, but it's going to be very special. That is the excited voice of playwright and Blix Executive (laughs) Director Becky Bozen. She and Peter Walquist have both joined me here this morning. They're bringing back the Dream Switch, the play feature vocalist Natty McClure and musician David Von Campen. That takes place this Sunday, October 3rd at the Thayer County Activity Center in Deschler, Nebraska. And that show begins at 1 p.m. and is free and open to the public. And if you want to know more about that or Ghoul's Night Out, we will be sure to have a link on our website. Great to see you both again. So good to see you. Thank you for Thank connecting you. us all. Thank you Thank so you. much, Jen. If you enjoyed that interview or an earlier interview and wish you could hear it again, you can play today's show as many times as you like online or download it. We podcast the show each week and you can look for that later this afternoon on our Facebook page or on our website. That address is nebraskapublicmedia.org. decision by one twin sister to hide her race fractures her family relationship in the novel The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. All About Books host Pat Leach has a review of this powerful story. Twin African-American sisters escape their oppressive Louisiana hometown to lead very different lives. A story about race, identity, and the consequences of individual choice. Hear a full review of the novel, The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. Go to our website, nebraskapublicmedia.org slash allaboutbooks. Support for programming for humanities-related programming on Nebraska Public Media comes from Humanities Nebraska, presenting a governor's lecture in the humanities, Finding Your Roots, a conversation with Henry Louis Gates, Jr. That's October 12th at Omaha's Holland Center and online. Details at humanitiesnebraska.org. Support for programming also comes from Cornerstone Bank, a family-owned bank providing custom investments, trust, and estate planning services since 1882, with 46 Central Nebraska locations. CornerstoneConnect.com. Cornerstone Bank, building trust on a solid foundation. Hi, my name is Tracy Schott, and I'm a performance poet from Omaha, Nebraska, currently residing in Council Bluffs, Iowa. The first poem that I'm going to do for you is called Gold. 
Good morning, my friends. Have I found you sitting on the edge of your bed, staring at your soul shattered in a million pieces, reminding you of the dirty laundry your mother repeatedly asked you to pick up? How now you wish it were dirty laundry needing a hamper. Edges sharp and cutting. You do not bleed. You have no more to give. Go ahead, my friend. Gather up those pieces of your soul. Gently. Place them in the outstretched hands of those who know, those who believe just what it takes to make your soul laugh, to make it sing, to make it cry. All without that inner rage. Go ahead, my friend. It will be okay. They will be your 21st century Shogun Ashikasha Yoshimasa, sending your broken pieces off to have seams of gold. You will have cracks filled with gold. You will be gold. You will be more beautiful than before. Repaired by artists not in this medium for reward, money, or fame. You, my friend will be whole. So go ahead. Gather up those pieces of your soul. Collect them. And place them in the outstretched hands of those of us who know. Go ahead. Yes, it will be okay. My next poem is a brand new poem just written called Kid Rock. Darling, you were my Kid Rock under a full moon. I was your boozy ginger beer in the back of a country watering hole. You showed me stars. I showed you, older woman. We were everyone's never would have guessed, blending like country and hip-hop over shared stories of adolescent loneliness that had faded into the background song of our adulthood. Alone in the kitchen, as you fried catfish and I rolled weed, we picked out gravel wedged within the cracks of our souls. I desired to wrap you up in happiness as your fingers danced Through my hair, we were what we were. We are what we are. A mutual misuse shot through the dark of a random early a.m. text. I wrote you a love poem. She took me for German food. It was only the second time I met her. Old couples in love waltzed around us. She sparkled. I don't yet know if she'll approve of the word sparkled. I, a Nebraska girl in OU gear at an OU game in a wheelchair, she didn't care. It was the first time I met her. Holding a phone smaller than my palm, my hands shake as I tell her I'm wearing my lucky OU socks. We're 900 miles apart. She wants me there. I want her in a field tripping on sunshine, backs on the ground blowing wishes on dandelions, her drawing the day on my shoulders as the sun notes its end. I want to be there. I want to recite childhood poetry on a corner end table as her bold artist insecurity forms my backdrop. We have fast-forwarded into sharing spells of self-realizations, In bigger words, responsibility, we've started to grow up. There has not been a third time I met her. It was canceled, snow blowing in, making only my husky dog happy. I wonder if she will say it is okay I wrote her a love poem. I need her to say it is okay I wrote her a love poem. Where we are just friends is not spoken of as an afterthought, as my words cuddle her from 900 miles away. Soon they will be collected, pages on a spine. Third time I meet her, we will finger paint the covers. Tracy Schott read, I Wrote You a Love Poem, Kid Rock, and Gold. 
Shot is a teaching artist with the Nebraska Writers Collective, Nebraska Arts Council, Lead Center for Performing Arts, and Omaha Girls Rock. She has been featured in multiple magazines and newspapers, as well as winning the 2018 Omaha Entertainment Arts Award for Best Performance Poet. She is a graduate of Nebraska Wesleyan University and laughs that if she could go back, she would pay more attention in Bill Clefcorn's poetry class. I'm Dave Hughes. Still ahead on Friday Live, an event on a river, and we'll catch up with Angels Theater as well as Oppend Music. Miss Myra and the Moonshiners come to Kearney this week to play New Orleans Jazz. I like to pull out kind of guitar as more of a lead instrument, um, whereas with traditional New Orleans jazz, guitar is kind of just hangs out in the background and um, plays the chords, but I like to kind of emphasize it with my group. Um, so we are just so fun and full of energy, and we bring so much spirit and enthusiasm to this type of music. Learn more about Miss Myra and her group with the Friday Live Extra by subscribing to the Friday Live podcast. Learn more online at Nebraska Public Media. Dot org. Support for programming on Nebraska Public Media comes from Union Bank and Trust, locally owned with a commitment to lasting relationships. UBT offers customers personal and business banking as well as wealth management services. Union Bank and Trust, member FDIC. Support for programming also comes from History Nebraska, recognizing everyday Nebraskans who do their part to preserve and share Nebraska's stories. The history of Nebraska belongs to the people. To learn more, history.nebraska.gov. Next here on Nebraska Public Media's Friday Live, the Bemis Center in Omaha is taking it to the river for their next musical event. KVNO's Corbin Hirschhorn has more. Other channels by artist Nadia Botello, presented by the Bemis Center, steps away from the gallery setting and onto a boat. The Missouri River will be the setting of this performance and discussion. Botello is something of a contemporary polymath, having been a coder, audio engineer, synchronized swimmer, and now a composer and sound designer. Her diverse background has led to a composition to be performed by members of the Omaha Symphony this Saturday. The past probably five to seven or eight years now, I've really been focusing on sound and water specifically. You know, we have so many issues surrounding water today, and it's the primacy of life for humans and for many living creatures, but it's also a terrifying force. And we are in a position where we have, you know, rivers that are flooding or rivers that are disappearing. And so I, I've really enjoyed having a practice that digs into questions around that and how an audience might be able to pay attention to what a body of water is saying. Boteo has been studying the Missouri River since before 2020. Her composition is conceptually inspired by the force of water, but it literally corresponds to data points, historical information, USGS water data, and maps from the last century. It is a non-traditional quartet, so it, it is a viola, violin, cello, and a contrabass. So I really wanted the bass to be a part of it because of the power of this river. I think it's well translated by that instrument. I think the overall overarching theme beyond having a group of people experience the river, pay attention to the river, and and listen to what the river might be saying to us in a way. I'm really interested in the complexity and friction around something that has been engineered and something that is just naturally powerful. So the river in its state is is really a friction point between both things. It is engineered and it is naturally created and a naturally wonderful thing. So what does that mean when you're floating down the river on a boat hearing a quartet and the river itself becomes its own voice in a way? In addition to the performance, this boat tour will feature three guest speakers offering their insights on the Missouri. The piece, you know, it's it's a balance between 
the literal with these data points, as well as, of course, like a, a representational conceptual piece. So there are definitely going to be moments where it's really melodic and really beautiful, but there are also points in the piece, especially in the third and fourth movements, where it feels like it's frustrating because it's literally hitting up on certain data points around, you know, like different infrastructure pieces within the river. Uh, it's literally, the composition is literally hitting a wall and you feel it and you don't get that resolution that you would. It's not the same choice that a traditional composition would make, but it's very intentional. And so I'm really interested in how people are going to um, respond to that. The Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts will present Other Channels by Nadia Botello this Saturday, October 2nd, from 3 to 6 p.m. For more information or to register, go to bemiscenter.org. For Friday Live, I'm Corbin Hershorn. I'm Genevieve Randall. Stay with Friday Live to hear the latest from Angels Theatre Company. And William Padmore will have a conversation about Wayne State College Theatre Productions. That's in about 12 minutes. Next, though, I'm joined by Tom Trenney with Aubin Music. The Sounding Light Chamber Choir performs this Sunday at 3 p.m. with a program of music that has a message of hope and resilience in the face of struggle. Tom, thanks for joining us this morning. My pleasure. Good to be with you. Let's tell listeners about this ensemble first. Um, What and who are Sounding Light? Sounding Light is a group I started almost 20 years ago. Next year will be its 20th season, and it's it's been a while since we've been able to be together, as you might imagine. But the idea of this group is that there are several singers that are from the community where we'll, where we'll be performing, but also we have others joining us from other places. Um, I think in this program we have people from six or seven states coming in together for the week. And so we have the joy of... Um, inviting new artists who have had different experiences than we and also sharing some of our um, way of being and doing with them. And so there's really a rich kind of sharing and a great tapestry. And this time in particular, the singers are also grateful to be together, to be reuniting with friends they haven't seen in a long, long time um, during this pandemic time. So it's been a real joy to be with them this week. It's amazing how it all just adds this layer of emotion. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're not a musician, I don't know if you can really imagine what that feels like to be able to get back to this. I mean, it really is a physical feeling in your body. Absolutely. And to be, you know, um, we're wearing masks in, in the choir now, but somehow it hasn't veiled at all the spirit and the communication that these amazing singers bring and that they share so generously with one another and those of us who um, who get to listen to, to them. Yeah. And I understand there's a single week of preparation for the singers and some of our listeners who are not musicians may wonder how that's possible. <laughs> Yeah, well, we definitely communicate with everyone ahead and ask them to come ready to go. But uh, even so, there are a lot of things you do to think about shaping together and feeling together that you only can do when you're in the room together. And again, that's just such a privilege, especially now after what what we've experienced, or maybe better said, not experienced in the last (laughs) several several years. Exactly. Now, Tom, I know that you choose music with intention, so I would love to hear more about this theme that you've pulled together with this program of hope and resilience in the face of struggle. The program is called And So We Go On, and I think th- uh, it's it's very present for this moment, but yet it always is. You know, in any given moment, there's somebody in our life who's having the most difficult time of their life and hopefully also somebody who's having the most joyful moment of their life. And they could well be in the same room at the same time. We're always between, you know, we've, we may have these illusions that we've gotten somewhere or um, that that we're close or that we're far, but we're always between, you know, and there's this wonderful piece that Jake Renestad composed to a poem of Todd Boss called, And So I Go On, which was what kind of prompted the opening up 
to this program um, for us. And it's a poem that's printed in two columns side by side. And on one side, it's the voice of the person who's still here who lost a loved one. And on the other side, it's the voice of the loved one speaking to their um, to their beloved from the other side. And so the, the piece is set for a double choir. One choir represents the one voice and the other. For example... It's a, each of them say, my lovely one, and then the next line, though you are gone, I am gone, taken from me, taken from you. And this very powerful poem leads to, to say, and so I go on, they both say the same words at the end, and so I go on, always, wherever you are, lovely one. And this is sort of the spirit and attitude of the whole program we've um, gathered around it to help us see that we're between this great connection and communion uh, in any moment and in every moment, and that music can remind us of that. Yeah, music, literature, poetry, like you've brought, are all ways for us to deal with these things. It even makes me think, Tom, of, of the fairy tales that seem a little dark you know, from, say, the Disneyfied version of them. But maybe that's just part of how we learn to deal with the inevitable things that happen in life. I think that's right. And for a lot of us who are musicians um, or who just so love music, being away from that place of expression during a time that was so difficult and and um, and and compromised for so many of us, you know, living into these messages now, um, they have more hope and they have more poignancy, I think. And I got to say, I've seen, um, out of, uh, I can only see the stu- singer's eyes this week. Can't see the rest of their faces, but I've seen a few eyes leaking some tears in, in very special parts of these pieces. And I think, uh, I hope people who would come either in person on, on Sunday or to hear the stream will also feel a deep connection and a heart connection to this program and the music. You have um, this, you've brought something with you here, Tom. What did you bring with you? Because you read a little bit of the one lyrics from it. Is this yeah. your program? Yeah, I, I brought the program <laughs> for this week. Just just in case you asked me what we were singing and I had a good, And you couldn't well, remember? Shit, couldn't think of it right away. But <laughs> do, you want, do you want to highlight a few things quickly other than the one you already talked about? um, There's everything from, uh, we start with a piece by William Byrd, uh, but then we get to hear several um, spirituals and uh, and songs from that tradition. One's arranged by one of our Lincoln composers, Marcus Garrett. Uh, And then there's a a newer piece by Dale Trumbor, an amazing uh, composer. Uh, And she writes a piece called In the Middle, and this is one that talks about our challenges of kind of beating the clock in our life in the middle of a life that's as complicated as everyone else's struggling for balance, juggling time. Um, and, and she talks about how we're always struggling to make time for the things that really matter. And I think in this moment, as we're all figuring out how to re-inhabit our lives as we're moving through this pandemic, it it's a piece I feel that's really spoken to us and that I, I hope will speak to the listeners as well um, in a very honest and relevant way. We hear things like, how do you keep the music playing, which is a kind of a great pop standard in a really slick um, vocal jazz uh, <laughs> setting. Awesome. And we have some great soloists here this week that emerge from within the choir that just bring so much heart to, to singing their um, poor wafering stranger. There's a gospel piece, Jehovah Sabaoth. So just a lot of very soulful, powerful music to share. Wow. I've heard across um, time there with the William Byrd and recent composers, across cultures, genders, practices, even genres with the jazz influence there. Sounds very diverse, Tom Trenny. Well, I've been talking with Tom here about the next performance on the Ovid Music Series. That's at First Plymouth in Lincoln featuring the chamber choir Sounding Light. And that is this Sunday, both streaming and in-person options, right? Yes, yes. At 3 p.m. Tom, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Blessings. This is Friday Live, and you can link to more about the Sounding Light concert or anything you hear about this morning on our website. Go to nebraskapublicmedia.org and look for the page for Friday Live. Here 
Pod Friday Live, the salon reading series hosted by Angels Theatre Company, is back this Sunday, October 3rd, in the Resonator Gallery at Turbine Flats in Lincoln. And Timothy Scholl joins me for more about that. Hey, Tim, nice to see you. Great to see you, too. How are you? I'm doing okay. Well, so this Sunday, it's um, Lauren Gunderson's The Heath. Correct. Tell me a little bit more about that and who Lauren Gunderson is. Oh, absolutely. So Lauren Gunderson is one of the most produced playwrights in America right now. Um, And you've probably never heard of her name, but you probably have heard of her work and and some things that she's done. This play in particular is a play that's in process. So the Salon Reading Series has moved to really looking at all new work. And the subtitle of this play is a banjo bluegrass memory play. Uh, so <laughs> I'm intrigued. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it should be a lot of fun. So we have, uh, you know, a banjo player. Um, it's, a, it's a very personal and beautiful story about um, Lauren actually working and trying to understand her grandfather and his life and, and background. And um, it's, it's, very, it's a very moving play. And, and so we really look forward to reading it and presenting it. And so just so listeners understand, you're, you're reading them. You mentioned there will be actual musical instruments there since that's there part of the... There will be an actual banjo, yes. <laughs> part of the play. But you're not staging it with costumes or scenes or anything. It is a reading, correct. <laughs> okay. Does that happen often with um, playwrights like Lauren that people know their work but not the playwright themselves? It sometimes happen, yeah. And sometimes you know the playwright without knowing what their works really are. So it, it happens a little bit both ways. But she's a prolific writer, just really some different kinds of plays in her repertoire. It's been fun getting to know her and talk to her through this process as we gain, you know, we get rights and things for these plays as well. So. Yeah, there is more to come in November and December and beyond. How do you do that process? So that process is is lots of fun, especially with new work, because you're dealing with new writers. You're dealing with playwrights who are living and active. And so you're either negotiating with them directly or working through their agents or saying, hey, we'd really, we really like your play. We'd really like to put it on. Um, and so you negotiate the royalties and things like that. And then we do them all for free here in Lincoln as part of this Salon Reading Series, which is going into its eighth year. Hey, congratulations yeah, on eight thank years. thank you. Yeah, we're really happy about that. Do you want to give us a sneak preview of just the next couple? Because I'm sure I'll talk to you again. We'll have to check in. Oh, absolutely. We'll check in. <laughs> the next one in November is actually a play by Fly Jamerson, who is a local playwright, a play called Frozen Fluid. Um, so we're looking forward to presenting that play as well. Um, Fly works also with the Great Plains Theater Conference, the Great Plains Theater Festival. Um, so we're kind of in basic negotiations and maybe making that kind of a crossover event with ah. them as well. And then we're going to have a reading in December called Primary User mm-hmm. by a playwright out of Nashville named Nate Epler. And it is a comedy based on technology. So I kind of wondered when I heard user. Primary you know, user, yeah, right. Primary user. Do you think, being in the turbine flats there in that gallery, do you think that the space kind of affects the experience or maybe even how the performers and readers read? I think it can. Um, You know, really the spaces that we look for for these readings, um, we've been in a variety of different places, but the last couple of places that we've been, and we really have found a a lovely home at at turbine flats and working with those folks. Um, But being in an art gallery... Uh, it's just a great crossover for a, a theatrical reading. And, you know, we have done presentations in the Sheldon Art Gallery. We were at uh, the Iron Tail Gallery for a little while. And, and just, I just find that the crossover between, you know, whatever art is on the wall plus whatever we're doing uh, as, as part of the piece just creates a really nice vibe. Really enjoyed that. You don't happen to know what art will be up I actually don't. Okay, it'll (laughs) be a surprise. It will be a surprise. uh, (laughs) And sometimes it creates quite a contrast. (laughs) (laughs) That's part part of the joy and the ephemerality of live theater, right? Yeah, exactly. And Tim, anything we're missing? I don't think so. We just really look forward to seeing everyone again. Um, This will be a live event. um, So we are requesting everyone to be double vaccinated and masks will be required. And uh, we're just so excited to be bringing live theater and readings into the Lincoln community and continuing this tradition that's been so much a part of our landscape for so long. All right. Tim Scholl, he's with Angels Theater Company, and we've been talking about the Salon Reading Series presented at Turbine Flats again in Lincoln this Sunday. Tim, thanks so much. Thank you.
Hello, listeners. William Padmore with Friday Live here. Today, I'm talking with Rusty Ruth, director of theater at Wayne State College, to talk about the department's upcoming show, The Diviners, playing next Wednesday through Sunday at the Black Box Theater in Wayne. Welcome. Oh, no problem. So we're here to talk about The Diviners, that the show that you're putting on. I read the synopsis for the play, and I have to admit, I had never heard of this play before. Uh, could you explain what The Diviners is? It's a play that takes place during the Depression era in, in a town, Zion, Indiana. And this town has been without a preacher for, for over 10 years. The citizens of the town sort of are in a um, desperate sort of rut. And then this backsliding preacher comes into town, a person who is running away from his past of being a preacher, just doesn't want to do it anymore, wants to be able to sort of have his own, make his own choices in life, uh, ends up befriending a family, the Lehman family. Their, their father, Ferris, owns a garage where he ends up working at. And then this preacher, C.C. Showers, ends up befriending the Lehman's youngest boy, uh, Buddy Lehman. And he uh, is an interesting character. He um, survived a near drowning incident when he was really young. He was three or four. And that incident took his mother's life. Since that moment, um, Buddy has had the ability to know when it's going to rain or where he can locate water. It's almost like he's a magnet for it. Uh, But he's definitely afraid of it. Refuses to bathe, refuses to wash. So creature comes into town and really has this connection with this special child. It's a very bittersweet show. Um, There's definitely highs and lows in CeCe's relationship with Buddy as well with the town. Yeah, there are a lot of conflicting themes in this story from what I read. So I'm very curious why this play and, and why now? It's described as lyrical, uh, but it's not a musical. But the way how it just flows, it's just, it's a beautiful story. And I think a lot of people can relate to sort of having self-doubt uh, and sort of running away from your past and then being thrusted into a situation where even though CC is not being a preacher, he's doing a lot of the sort of things that a preacher would do in terms of how he's trying to reach and teach this child who is struggling with not only his own hygiene, but understanding that his mother has been gone and um, and is really about that mentorship. And so I think a lot of people will be able to relate to that sort of conflict. We have the idea of wanting to do what you want to do, but then there's a certain sort of gift that you may have that you are sort of shirking those duties. Another thing I want to tackle is the religious aspect of the play. As we've Mm -hmm. indicated, religion plays a big part in this play. And not giving anything away, but religion leads to good things and arguably bad things in this play. How do you juggle something as heavy as religion? And that did that cause you to hesitate? Yeah, I don't even really even think personally that it's an anti-religious play at all. I I feel a lot of the conflict that's happening between Showers and one particular character who's really trying to thrust him back into that position is all about miscommunication. Um, There's moments where this other character comes in and just assumes what he's doing is religious in nature, and there's not really ever direct conversation. That character is well-intended, you understand her point of view of wanting to have um, a preacher back in the fold for her town. You know, I don't think it's definitely an anti-religious play. I think it's more, it deals with that miscommunication and as well as just someone forced to do something that maybe their heart's not into. We could probably talk about this play all day, but uh, I do want to uh, tackle one more thing before we move on, and that is the character of uh, Buddy. Mm -hmm. He is a mentally disadvantaged person what goes into directing that sort of acting and sure. the sensitivity around it and the great thing about the play the playwright specifically states um you know you don't want to make it too stereotypical i mean if anything the, the child had sort of a traumatic brain injury from being underwater too long but the idea is that we play the sort of the sense of wonder with the character the the overly innocent quality because that character goes through some things at the end that can be gut-wrenching 
it was important for us to show just the, almost the childlike quality. I don't mean that as an insult, but the, the sense of wonder of looking at things differently than an adult would look at in order it to be a, a really charming character. I worked with Cam, um, Cam Turner, who's our buddy, and he's doing a fantastic job. I had him watch different videos of, of different styles of adults or in children with a developmental disability just to get sort of the essence of it without it being overly stereotypical Uh, Because also we wouldn't want to necessarily offend anyone as well if it it was too stereotypical. Unfortunately, I still have to ask about COVID. Um, What are the precautions or protocols that will be in place for this performance, if any? We're operating right now under normal circumstances. We're going to have our normal audience uh, numbers in the house that we've had two years ago. That's the sort of the precaution that Wayne State has been taking for other events at this time. Uh, So as the community of Wayne, we have not had any issues with the NERCAST or any major issues on campus at this time. So fingers crossed, everything seems to be on the right trajectory. The only thing that we've been asking is that like in the lobby after the show that we're going to ask people to sort of disperse just because that's a smaller space. So to get 90 people that would essentially be really crammed in there we'll we're going to ask them to sort of meet with loved ones and stuff sort of in a different area like outside but we're still able to get about 90 people for this show sir this has been a pleasure thank you so much once again for taking the time out yeah absolutely thanks so much happy to help I've been talking with Rusty Ruth of Wayne State College about his upcoming show, The Diviners. For more information, head to our website, nebraskapublicmedia.org slash Friday Live. I'm William Padmore with Friday Live. Coming up this morning on Nebraska Public Media, classical music on morning concert. And this afternoon, Penelope Morrow is in on classics by request. Be sure to visit the Nebraska Public Media website for podcasts of the show at nebraskapublicmedia.org. Portions of Friday Live are pre-recorded thanks to everyone who makes Friday Live possible, including Carrie Meese, William Padmore, Shannon Clare, and associate producer Dave Hughes. I'm Genevieve Randall. Support for programming on Nebraska Public Media comes from Constellation Studios, a mixed-use artist's workspace for all types of printmaking and paper projects, featuring printing presses, bookmaking, type shop, and wet paper studio. For info, constellation-studios.net. Support for programming also comes from Abend Music, opening its 50th season with the Sounding Light Chamber Choir delivering a message of hope and resilience in the face of struggle. Sunday, October 3rd at 3 p.m., First Plymouth Church in Lincoln. This concert does not require a ticket. To learn more, abendmusic.org.